I was wandering in the forest edge to amuse myself when I realized I got totally lost. <laughs> What's that sound? All of a sudden, a blur of golden and black spots leaped towards me. I'm doomed! Guys, I'm here in Africa on vacation to support my parents with their new reality show. Oh, duty calls. See you later, Moaz. Hi, I'm Vivian, an influencer from Ottin, Germany. My mom and dad are actors, which does have some perks. They gave me everything I wanted. Branded clothes, supercars, fancy phones, except for one thing. Their time. Christmas, birthdays, graduation ceremony, whatever the occasion, they missed it. My friends thought I had the perfect life, but my only wish was to be picked up at school by my parents once. <sighs> I was hoping this trip would be different, but it seems nothing has changed. They seem to have forgotten about their daughter's presence. Duh. That's why I always had to rely on strangers' attention like this. Being here alone was so boring, so I decided to amuse myself by live streaming in the forest edge. Hey viewers! Oh crumbs, I only have one signal bar. Hang on! Looks like I wandered further than I meant to. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> What's that sound? All of a sudden, a blur of golden and black spots leaped towards me. I'm doomed. I still haven't eaten caviar pizza, and I still don't own a Gucci bag in every color. I haven't even become prom queen. I can't die. Wait, were my eyes deceiving me? Or was the leopard really knocked out by some jungle guy swinging on a vine? Oh boy, he sure does resemble Tarzan. Beautiful. Thank, thank you? I turned to reach for my phone and realized it had fallen on the ground and I was still live streaming. Viewers were bombarding me with sad and wow face emojis and flooding my comments with concerned messages. Then my parents and the crew showed up. Turns out this guy had been lost in the jungle since he was a little boy and he was raised by monkeys. His parents had passed away by now. I know, but I got lost too. Why they... Then, mom and dad announced that they'd bring this jungle boy home under the guise of being charitable. Pfft. Wasn't it for publicity? They named him Taz and gave him a makeover. Well, at least they tried to. All the suits he tried on tore, as he was way too muscly. It took an entire box of candy bars to make him agree to shave, and he still refused to cut his hair. He could only speak a limited number of words and sentences he remembered from being a kid, so mom and dad had to hire a tutor to teach him to read and write, which was me. He hated living in the house, and after several occasions where he climbed out of the window and slept in the garden, my parents built him an amazing jungle zone room. But then he kept me awake all night with his incessant ape howling noises. My parents even brought him to their shows, and all they talked about every day was Taz this, Taz that which made me feel like an outsider. This was really hard for me, but I tried to be patient. Then one day, my parents told me the worst news ever. Taz is going to come to school with you as your bodyguard. We don't have time to do it. At least this time we'll know you'll be safe. What? B -b -b I don't need a bodyguard. Especially not one that can't even speak properly. Taz knows basic conversation now. I don't see the problem. So the next day, Taz started to stick to me. I set some ground rules. He had to stay 10 feet away from me at all times, and he wasn't allowed to mutter a single word to me. Thankfully, Mia, my bestie, was there to provide some normality to the freak show that was currently my life. Coffee for the hottie. Don't drink. Me test first. Taz say safe for V to drink. Mmm, yummy. Then I quickly explained everything to her. He's kind of hot, in a wild way. Don't you dare say that again! But later, despite my rules, Taz stuck to me like glue. Parents told Taz must guard V. Worst of all, the other students treated him like a celebrity. They took his photo, asked him dumb questions which caused traffic congestion in the hall. He immediately ran up the wall like a ninja to escape the crowd, making them even more excited and chase after him. That night, I checked my Instagram and was excited to see that I was only 2k followers away from 500k. Yahoo! Then, an account caught my eye. That dude even has a fan page? For real? He stole my parents? My school popularity? And now he's trying to steal my followers too? What's with these crazy people? Why are they all so obsessed with him? At least there still exists a normal person. And handsome as well. Yeah, my Henry. I've secretly liked him for years, but even this sassy Instagram queen has a weakness. Just looking at him made my legs shake, so I admired him in secret. The next day, I was sneakily putting letters and gifts on Henry's desk when Taz interrupted. Why'd we do that? 
Ugh, it's for love. When you really like someone, you show them with romantic gestures. Okay, it's like giving your last morsel of food to someone even though you're extremely hungry. Got it? Seeing as Taz was huge, it was no surprise he was soon asked to join the basketball team. Guess who else was on it? Yep, Henry. Hmm, so I've got an idea. Maybe Taz was my way of getting closer to him. I asked Taz to give Henry a soda, but Taz accidentally shook it too hard. So when Henry opened it, he got totally soaked. Then I told Taz to support Henry during the match, but Taz was so into the game that he accidentally pushed Henry's pants down, revealing his Hello Kitty underwear. Everyone laughed at him and he was so humiliated that he ran off the court. After the match, Taz came to me saying he was sorry, then continued, Taz not like Henry. I decided it was better to separate Taz and Henry before he ruined everything. All right, so I think it's best if you quit basketball. But Taz likes basketball. No big deal. I can ask my parents to build you a private basketball court and... Play with you? But from now on, you'll have to listen to me. The best ape ever! Shh, stop saying silly things! Taz seemed so grateful for his new basketball court that he started caring about me more. He brought me an overload of fresh fruit, a bit too fresh, and checked it on whenever I was sad. I had just been at ease for a while before Taz was messing around again. I had a movie premiere to attend, and was about to change into my stunning Versace dress, only to discover it had been swapped for a dress made from actual leaves. Green! Beautiful, she said! Luckily, I managed to arrange another dress just in time, but at the premiere, when the press interviewed me, Taz appeared. The best ape ever! I was so embarrassed, I turned bright red and forgot my words. Thanks to Taz, I became a netizen laughing stock. I sweared that I would pay this back, and my chance finally came. The audience loved Taz, but big crowds freaked him out, and he always tried to find a way to hide. During one press conference, I saw him run off frightened, so I followed him. Hey Taz, is there a place that will make you feel better? I can take you there. If we take Taz to jungle, Taz happy. So I took him to the Dower Forest. As soon as we got there, Taz's mood changed. He ran wild and then stopped at a large oak tree. V, why letters? This is the bridegroom's oak tree. Local people like to leave love letters here. Then we sat down under the tree and Taz looked so upset. Taz not like bright light and flashes. That's okay, we can just chill here, right? Great, seeing Taz leave the show on his own, then surely mom and dad wouldn't like him anymore. Only, when we returned home, my parents weren't furious with Taz, but with me! Vivian, you should be setting a good example for Taz, not just inciting and taking him away from important events! Can you stop acting like a child and think before you act for once? I shut myself in my room and I had a complete meltdown. Then I rang Mia to confide in her. Living with Taz is a nightmare. He has to leave. What do you mean? I'm going to find a way to kick him out. The next day at school, I was walking along the hallway when Henry appeared in front of me. V, you have to convince Taff to rejoin the basketball team. We can't win the final without him. Please, I'll do anything you want. Wow, seems like my Christmas gift came early. Anything you say? How about taking me to prom? Actually, that's what I've always wanted to do. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I was frozen. This was incredible! Hmm, I guess my kick out Taz plan would have to wait for now. So I humbled myself to convince him. As expected, with the help of Taz, the team won. Only neither he or Henry showed up to get their trophy. I went looking for them and found Taz pouncing on Henry. Taz, stop it! But he was too full off rage to listen to me, so I had to jump between them. He is completely out of control. You can forget about the prom then. This is all your fault! You stole everything from me since the day you were back from that freaky jungle, and now you've beaten up my crush! All you've done is ruin my life! Why can't you just give me a loan? Then he left. For real. This felt great, as I'd finally got rid of the thorn in my eye. Only, I couldn't shake away this empty feeling. Scrolling through my old comments didn't help, and neither did live streaming. <sighs> I suddenly realized I missed the special way Taz cared about me. And when with him, I didn't have to hide or force myself to be anything other than me. I aimlessly wandered to Dodor Forest and stopped at the oak tree. A letter poking out of the hole caught my eye. I picked it up and recognized it was Taz's try-to-be-neat-but-scribbled handwriting. Henry Liar. He's with Mia. My head was still spinning when my phone went crazy. I checked and saw my inbox was full of rude comments. Then I soon found the viral audio. 
Jazz is a nightmare. He has to leave. I'm going to find a way to kick him out. I was literally petrified for a few seconds, while netizens kept going crazy saying I was so ungrateful to Taz even after he'd saved my life. How could she? I immediately went to Mia's house to confront her about it. It was you, the only one I confided my story. Oh well, Miss Obvious. It was me. So what? Henry's mine, not yours. He just told you what you wanted to hear to get Taz back on the team. But that moron overheard Henry talking to me and dared to hurt him. You, you... Hi's talk about the jungle, dud. Total simp and stupid. I told him you'd love a leaf dress and he totally bought it. <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get my hair done for a date with Henry. Mwah. I felt like an elephant had slapped right on the face. So Taz was right. Back home, I gloomily pulled out Taz's letter. But hold on, there's still another part. Why didn't I realize it sooner? Right then, my parents arrived home. They'd heard that audio and were absolutely furious. It's your fault Taz ran away. Now we have to compensate for the contracts of the shows he was supposed to be in. You don't care about anyone. Says you. All you do is give me money and that's it. You're never there when I need you. Never. Even Taz cares about me more than you both do. Then I ran off right away. I kept going until I ended up under this bridge. Then I saw him. He was playing with some stray cats and dogs. I immediately ran to hug him and started apologizing, but he pointed behind me and said, Bad guys, bad guys. I turned around to see two figures headed this way. I dragged Taz into the corner and we watched them bundle the cats and dogs into sacks. They were definitely up to no good, so I used my phone to record them, but... What you aiming at, kids? I woke up feeling dizzy to realize that we were both tied up in an abandoned house. Still no reply from her parents. They better pay up, or else... You're wasting your time. They don't care about me. The thieves ignored me and kept calling and calling, but still no answer. That was it. I was going to die here. I mean, we. Then, when it was pitch black out there, the door barged open and walked in, mom and dad with a bag of money. As the thieves counted the money, dad tried dialing the police, but one of them came throwing his phone right away and beat him up. Say goodbye to your daughter. Please don't hurt her. Hurt me instead. This really shocked me, as I'd only ever seen other people bowing to my parents before, not the other way around. The one guy raised a plank of wood to hit me, but right at this time, Taz leaped free and knocked them out cold. The police arrived soon after that and arrested the thieves. Mom and Dad immediately rushed to me. Are you okay, sweetie? We were worried sick when you were nowhere to be seen. And we're sorry for making you feel unwanted. We never had money growing up and struggled a lot. That's why we wanted a different life for you. We kept working and working and thought giving you money over our time was the best way to show our love, but we were wrong. Mom, Dad, what I really need from you is your presence. It's more precious than anything. And thank you for everything. Okay, I protect V. I protect animals, too. Now I've realized what I needed the most. It was to always stay true to myself, like this dummy. I didn't want to be some fancy influencer anymore. Instead, Taz inspired me to use my reputation to establish an organization to care for abandoned animals. As for my dear ex-best friend and dear ex-crush, meh, they didn't matter to me anymore. Because you know what? The sweetest revenge is to live a fabulous life. At the end of the prom, I asked Taz about the note. Taz, did you write this? I'm glad you asked. I practiced many times to say those words. Now time to say officially. I like you, V. You're my best ape ever. Hey, I'm Amy, I'm 23, and I've been besties with my neighbor Drew for years. But I've never thought of sabotaging his wedding, ever! Heck, I thought I'd be the one marrying him. Well, I mean, if no one better came along, Drew's two years older than me. But back then, I wasn't your regular girly girl. Instead, I much preferred hanging out with the boys and playing basketball, so we quickly became best friends. But when I hit puberty, how I looked began to matter more to me. So I started making efforts and behaved more like a lady, result being that guys started noticing me, Drew included. One time back in high school, Drew asked me out, but I just laughed it off and told him to stop kidding. In other words, I rejected him. It was good to know that I had him as a backup, but right then and there, I didn't want to date him. 
Why would I, when I could have any boy in the school? After that, he pretty much did anything I asked, treated me like a princess, and followed me everywhere I went. Heck, we were so close that it was an in-joke with my family that we would end up together. When I went to study in Europe for three years, Drew was still there for me when I went through tough times, or even breakups. Being in a different country meant that Drew and I didn't talk as much as we used to, but I knew that if I needed him, then all I needed to do was click my fingers and he'd appear. Whenever I came back home for the holidays, he was always there at the airport waiting to pick me up. So when I finished my studies and arrived home for good, I expected him to be there to pick me up with a large bunch of flowers in hand. But no, he didn't show up. It was only my parents waiting for me. On the journey home, I sat there sulking. Drew had majorly annoyed me. How dare he stand me up? Sensing my mood, Mom asked, Sweetie, what's up? Aren't you happy to be back? I muttered out, Yeah, I just don't appreciate Drew not picking me up. Mom casually said, Oh, right. Although, I suppose planning the wedding is keeping him busy. I'm sure he just forgot. I sat upright in my seat. What? Wedding? Whose wedding? My mom then acted surprised. He didn't tell you? Oh, how busy the groom-to-be must be. <laughs> Honey, it's Drew's wedding. This uneasy feeling washed over me. I felt like I'd been cheated on. Okay, so I didn't love him. But that's not the point. How dare some girl come along and steal him away from me? I arrived home to see Drew pacing the curb. He spotted me and gave me an excited wave. I stormed over to him and shouted out, Why didn't you tell me you're getting married? He smiled and then replied, I'm sorry, Amy. I just wanted to do it in person as I have an important question to ask you. He sounded so serious. Then he reached into his pocket. OMG, was he going to propose to me? Has this all been a prank leading to this moment? But no, he pulled out a packet of mints and offered me one. At that moment, a girl walked out of his house and passed him a coffee. He wrapped his arms around her waist and kissed the top of her head. Yuck! Amy, you remember Emily, right? She was in your year at school. She's my fiancé. We'd like to ask you to be our bridesmaid. Emily added, Actually, he wanted you to be his best man, since we all know how close you guys are, but that would look a little strange, don't you think? I just stood there speechless with my mouth wide open. No, I didn't remember this Emily girl from school, and I didn't want to be her stupid bridesmaid. Drew joked, Aren't you happy for me? I know you'll love this. That's why I waited till now to tell you, to be able to see your over-the-top reaction. <laughs> I had no reaction. I literally couldn't find any words to say and just stood there motionless as the realization that the guy I could always count on was now someone else's, and I was meant to help them out with their lame wedding. I tried being happy for them, but they just made me feel so sick. Now whenever I wanted to see Drew, there's Emily tagging along, and they always talk to each other in this annoying high-pitched voice, not to mention the kissing and hugging every five seconds. I couldn't stand seeing their PDA for another moment, so I decided to pull some mischievous pranks. First, I kept asking Emily to eat fast foods with me, which I told her that I extremely craved for since I'd been abroad for so long. But the real reason was just that I wanted her to gain weight quickly and be unable to fit into her wedding dress. And I succeeded. When the three of us visited the wedding shop, whichever dress that Emily liked to try, she couldn't fit in. So the only one that fitted her looked very old-fashioned and ugly. Seeing her sulky face, I was so happy inside. Until Drew ran towards her and comforted her, he praised her as the most beautiful woman in the world, no matter what she wore. And he was very lucky to marry her. Ugh. I want to puke for real. A few days later, Emily held her bachelorette party. As the party venue was close to my house, Emily and her friends decided to come over to prepare themselves before the party. Though I found it bothersome at first, then I realized that it's a good opportunity for another prank. That afternoon, when they were all busy putting on makeup and getting dressed, I offered to help Emily iron her dress as I was ironing mine. She agreed and handed me the dress. I secretly turned up the iron's temperature, and it burnt her silk dress in a blink. I screamed and acted like it was an accident. Emily and her friends immediately rushed over. They were shocked to see the dress was totally ruined. I apologized frantically as tears started to well up in Emily's eyes. Are you sure you didn't do it on purpose? A friend of Emily asked me. Then everyone gave me a dirty look. No, don't say that. Amy's just trying to help me. 
Emily said through tears. Jeez, why did she have to be so nice? After that, she called Drew, cried desperately, and told him everything. And just half an hour later, Drew showed up and handed Emily a brand new dress, which is even prettier than the old one. Emily hugged Drew, kissed him on the cheek, and went on and on about how he's the best. Yuck. Suddenly, some of Emily's friends whispered something like, Emily is so lucky to have a fiancé like Drew. Unlike Carl, he is really useless. So Carl was Emily's ex, right? I wondered if he also wanted to break this wedding like me. So I did some digging online and easily found Carl. Then I messaged him, telling him I was Emily's bridesmaid and I had something super urgent to tell him about her. He agreed to meet me at a bar downtown. First impression? This guy's actually kinda cute. Turns out, goody two-shoes Emily has good taste in guys. As I sat down next to him, I noticed that Carl had been drinking a lot. But I didn't think much of it at the time. I gave my best convincing look and told him, Emily still has feelings for you. She's now having cold feet about the wedding. At first, he didn't say much. He just kept on drinking. But suddenly, he stood up and slurred out how he needed to confess his love to her. Right now! So I followed him to her house. That night, the bridesmaids were having a sleepover at Emily's to help her prepare the guest list for the wedding and stuff. I quickly came in and made up some excuse for showing up late. And that's when we all heard something noisy coming from outside. Everyone ran to the porch to check out Carl begin to drunkenly slur out something like, I will always love you and such. Emily looked shocked and tried persuading Carl to go home. I watched on with a secret smirk as he threw up in her pot plant, accused the other bridesmaids of being traitors, and tripped over the cat as he tried to enter her house. Carl eventually passed out on the couch, and Emily, being Emily, placed a blanket over him. She didn't even look angry. Why? I couldn't understand why I had done so many things, but she could be so calm and overcame everything. The next day, when Carl woke up, they talked, and I was terrified Carl would tell Emily about my involvement. But instead, he apologized to her, wished her the best for the future, then left. A few days later, Carl asked me to meet him at a coffee shop. He asked me why I lied to him, as Emily said she was very blissful to marry Drew. I sighed and told him the truth. I also said that I didn't have feelings for Drew, I just hated to see the two of them together. Then Carl said, Don't let jealousy get the best of you. Listen to me, Amy. What we need to do now is restore our life and leave the past behind. I felt down upon hearing his words, but I knew Carl was right. Despite Drew having been my best friend since childhood, it was the moment he needed to have a life of his own. Don't be so sad, Carl said, patting my hand gently. I looked up and was fascinated by not only Carl's look, but also his maturity and sensitivity. The wedding day came. I stood next to Drew and Emily as they exchanged their rings to take a vow to be husband and wife. Somehow, I felt so proud that my best friend found his life partner. But still, I felt a little uneasy inside, until I spotted Carl in the crowd. He walked over, gave me a bright smile, and joked that he was going to spend the rest of the day here so I couldn't cause any more havoc. I laughed out loud and responded, it was more about him than me that would be causing trouble in the wedding. After the ceremony, we spent time together walking through the park and went to an arcade. I have to admit that it was kind of fun and took my mind off things. Since then, something weird happened. I have found myself thinking about Carl a lot. Like, a lot. Am I developing feelings for him? Maybe now is the time for me to find my life partner too. And I think I've found a great candidate. Hi, I'm Diane and I'm 20 years old. I fell in love on the first day of college. I'm not even joking. I'd promised my mom I'd focus on my studies and wouldn't fall for any boys. But one look at Brett and I broke that promise immediately. We had an instant connection and pretty soon we were spending every waking moment together. I can't help but think that if I hadn't met him, maybe I'd never have found out the dark secret my mom and aunt had been hiding from me my whole life. You see, my mom raised me alone, and I had no idea who my dad was. Let's just say it seemed like my mom got around, so she really didn't want me to get into the same kind of situation as her. I decided to keep Brett a secret. She didn't need to know, right? When I went home for Christmas vacation, I missed Brett so much, but I couldn't let my mom know about him. So I'd wait until she went to bed before calling him. One night, she caught me, though. She must have gone to the bathroom, and suddenly I heard footsteps. 
She was standing right there. I didn't know how much she heard, but I was so embarrassed. I thought she'd grab the phone from me and tell me off, but instead, she just walked back to bed. It was so weird. In the morning, she was sitting at the kitchen table grinning and said, Well, who is he then? Invite him over. Don't be shy. I couldn't believe it. I thought she'd freak out, but instead she wanted to meet him. She suggested we invited him over for dinner, as my aunt was also coming over that night. My mom and my aunt were like best friends and had basically raised me together, so I was excited for her to meet Brett too. He took the bus that afternoon, as he was desperate to see me, and my mom said he could stay in the spare room. As soon as my mom saw Brett, she grinned at me and whispered how handsome he was. Then we sat down to dinner and started chatting. My mom had so many questions for him, and it was a bit awkward. She wouldn't shut up, and it made her seem so nosy. She asked where he'd grown up, and what his mom and dad did, and even asked for their names and stuff. Meanwhile, my aunt just sat there quietly, and then at one point she got up from the table and went out into the garden. My mom ran after her, and Brett looked at me worried. I had no idea what was wrong. Ten minutes later, my mom came in and her expression had totally changed. She went from being warm and friendly to totally strict and cold. She looked at both Brett and I and said she decided I was far too young to have a boyfriend staying over, and then asked Brett to leave. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was 20 years old. She was being so rude. So I said to her, Mom, why? Please, can he just stay? I was almost begging her, but she looked so serious and firm, and I knew she wasn't going to change her mind. Brett was even more shocked than me. I mean, it had been my mom who'd invited him in the first place, and now there she was, shooing him away. He quickly grabbed his stuff and ordered a taxi. I was so upset I didn't even say bye to him. I just burst into tears and felt so angry at my mom. Right after Brett left, I ran upstairs and locked myself in my room, and my mom stood on the other side begging to speak to me. She said there was something she needed to tell me. I refused to come out and instead sat on the floor on the other side of the door. I could hear my mom crying and knew this was serious. She said the reason she didn't want Brett to stay was because he was actually my half-brother. No, I didn't understand. I asked if my dad was also Brett's dad, and then I got angry. I thought my mom hadn't known who my dad was. I opened the door and I was about to start shouting at her when she told me what was really going on. I'd been adopted. Well, actually, I'd been kidnapped by my aunt when I was born. It's a long, shocking story, but basically my biological parents were this rich couple, but they were struggling to get pregnant. My biological mom had a best friend called Ashley, who she told everything to, but Ashley secretly had a crush on my dad. She seduced my dad until one night they slept together, and Ashley ended up getting pregnant. My dad was so happy and promised Ashley he'd help raise the baby, but that he couldn't divorce my mom. This made Ashley angry. She wanted my dad all to herself, and wanted their kid to become the heir to his company. At the same time, my biological mom fell pregnant with me, and when my dad found out, he quickly forgot about Ashley and tried to forget about the mistake he'd made that one night. This, of course, made Ashley even more angry, but she still pretended to be friends with my mom. When my mom went into labor with me, my dad was away on a business trip, and Ashley paid someone to sneak into the hospital and kidnap me. That person turned out to be my aunt. She did it because she was desperate for cash— so she snuck in, dressed up as a nurse, and in the middle of the night stole me away. But she wasn't cold-blooded enough to just throw me away or leave me at an orphanage. So she took me to her sister's place and told her that she'd found me abandoned on the street. Her sister, who had never wanted to get married but had always wanted to be a mom, was so happy and decided to raise me. But then a few days later it was all over the news, a missing baby. There was an exact description of what I'd been wearing, and even a photo of me just after I'd been born. There was no denying that I was the missing baby. My new mom confronted my aunt about it and found out the truth. My aunt said there was no way they could return me as my aunt had already spent all the money she'd been paid to cover some debts. And she didn't want to go to prison, so they decided to raise me as if I really was their own. 
That secret would still have been hidden from me if I hadn't brought Brett home. My mom was so shocked that I'd brought my dad and Ashley's son into her home and introduced him to her as my boyfriend. As my mom told me all of this, I just sat there frozen. This was absolutely unbelievable. I felt sick. They'd lied to me all these years, and even worse, my boyfriend was actually my half-brother. My whole life was one big mess. I hate you, Mom, and I hate you too, I said to my aunt. You helped that evil monster Ashley get what she wanted, and now you've ruined my life and taken away my family. My mom reached out to hug me, but I didn't want her near me. We both just sat there crying. She tried to calm me down and get me to relax. Then she sighed and said, I'm sorry. I'm truly sorry. Your whole life, I've been trying to make it up to you. I thought my love for you would be enough. As for Ashley, well, I heard she didn't get what she wanted in the end. Wait, why? I don't understand. But she successfully kidnapped me, right? I wiped my tears and looked at her. Yes, sweetie, but her main goal was to become your dad's wife. But that obviously didn't happen. Then she continued. After my aunt had kidnapped me, Ashley had given birth to Brett and was so happy thinking that my parents no longer had a baby and that my dad would now leave my mom and go live with her. But that's not what happened. Yes, their dear daughter was taken away, but my dad still stayed with my mom and loved her even more. My dad didn't get together with Ashley, but apparently my dad had still been helping raise Brett until now. There's definitely no bad blood between them because I've heard Brett talk about his dad quite a lot. Now there was only one thing for it. I had to find my biological parents and find out the rest of the story. They deserved to know I was alive. But now, what would I do about Brett? I'd have to break up with him somehow. Hi. My name is Mia, and I lived the first 14 years of my life trapped in a lie. I never left the house. And by that, I mean never. I grew up believing that I was allergic to the sun, and if I stayed out in it too long, I'd turn to dust. Dumb. I know. But I was just a kid, and I had no reason not to believe what my mom told me. On the rare occasions, I went out into the backyard, and my skin turned all blotchy and puffy. Looking back on it now, it's clear mom had given me something to bring my skin out in a rash, but at the time, I honestly believed the sun was out to get me. I remember peering behind the curtain and watching the kids play out in the street. They looked like they were having so much fun, and I felt so sad that I couldn't join them. Mom charged into my room, quickly closed the curtain, and then she grabbed my shoulders and shouted at me, Mia, never do that again. The sun can come in through the curtains and turn you to a crisp. Is that what you want? I remember sobbing as I shook my head. I never did peer out at the other kids again after that. I could still hear them playing. So I would close my eyes and imagine that I was out there with them, playing chase and learning how to ride a bike. I so wanted that to be my reality. The problem was I didn't have that life. Instead, I was stuck inside with no friends. I'd never even touched the grass before. Mom homeschooled me. She took this really seriously and got really mad when I didn't understand something. One time, I gave the wrong answer to a math equation, so she screamed at me. You're such an idiot! I've had enough of you! Then she locked me in my room without dinner. Crazy, huh? But back then, I was so scared that from then, I didn't dare to ask her anything. It's always just mom and me and no one else in my house. She said my dad had died when I was a baby. Again, I had no reason not to believe her. I never had a phone to talk to anyone. And who did I have to talk to? Still, I remember being fascinated by this strange object she often pressed to her ear. Whenever she was on the phone, I believed she was talking to herself. Mum would lock me in the house while she went out. Then when she returned, she'd just throw me something to eat. A sandwich, a packet of potato chips, and sometimes she changed the meal to bread. She never really cooked. I'm not even sure if she knew how to. My house was a simple old house. There's not many things in it. No TV, no sofa, a basic kitchen. I mean, it looks like an abandoned house, 
but I thought it was normal because I had not seen any other houses. My room was small, cold, and dark. I only had a hard mattress and some itchy old pillows. I didn't even have a bed cover. I used to shiver myself to sleep each night and dream of being out there playing with the other kids. Then, things got worse when I turned ten. Mom stormed into my room, gave me some food and a pile of books, and told me that I had to stay in my room from now on so she knew I was safe. I put up with four years of this. It was horrible. She chucked my meals at me and gave me new books once a week. I felt so hungry and lonely all the time. Then one day, when evening arrived and she still hadn't fed me, my hunger pains got the better of me. So I tried the door, and to my surprise, it wasn't locked. So I snuck downstairs. That's when I saw Mom pacing the room, her phone in hand. She said, Yes, I know, Toby. Well, she's finally of age, so when are you coming to get her? Then she said, Tomorrow at 10 a.m. I will be counting the money. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew something wasn't right. Then I heard Mum say, Well, I suppose I better go and feed her then. I quickly darted upstairs and lay on my mattress. Mum appeared and passed me a sandwich and some water. She sat down next to me, which was odd, as she hardly ever did this. And she smiled at me as she said, We need to get you cleaned up, and I've bought you a new dress to wear. Why, Mum? I asked her. Her smile faded into a scowl, and she kicked my mattress. Why do you always have to be so insolent? I didn't want to upset her further, so I didn't ask her anything else. Then the next day, Mum made me put the new dress on and let me out of my room. Then there was a knock at the door, and Mum brought this strange man in. I'd never interacted with anyone other than Mum before, so I just sat there, feeling afraid. He was around my mum's age and tall, really tall, and he had unkind eyes. He passed my mum an envelope, and she opened it and took out a lot of bits of paper. I know now that this was money, but back then, I didn't fully understand what it was. Mum counted it out, then nodded at him and said, She's all yours. Right. You're coming with me, sweetie. He walked towards me. Wh what I stared at him, open-mouthed. Mia, you're going to live with this man now. Mom said it like it was no big deal. That's what happens when you turn 14. You have to leave. But Mom, why? I don't know him. I won't go. Then she slapped me and shouted out loud, Go with him. I'm done with you. That's when I realized that I couldn't live with this woman anymore. I ran out of the front door. Surely turning to dust was better than living with any of them. Only, as the sun touched my skin, it didn't burn. That's when I knew Mum had been lying to me all this time, so I started running without knowing where I was going. I could hear Mum and that Toby guy chasing and shouting after me, but I just kept on running. Every little sound freaked me out, as I didn't understand this world and the people in it. The next thing I remember is some woman shaking me and saying, Sweetie, are you okay? I was so afraid at first and curled up into a ball, but then she told me she wasn't going to hurt me, she just wanted to help me. She had kind eyes, not like mom or that man, so I told her what had happened. She looked completely shocked, but she rang the police. So, it turns out that when I was a baby, I was stolen. My mom isn't really my mom at all. She was some messed up woman who took me out of my pushchair and made some awful deal with that Toby man that he could buy me off her when I was 14. She didn't know my real parents. She just saw a chance to grab me, and she took it. It's horrible to think that she robbed me of a normal life, but I try not to dwell on this thought too much. I can't change the past. Then eventually, something amazing happened. My real parents were found. It was so emotional seeing them for the first time. They hugged me, and... We all just cried. They told me how they'd never stopped looking for me. And guess what? I found out I have a little sister called Izzy. I love hanging out with her and watching her play. She's the best. It's been hard. There's so much I've had to learn, such as how to interact with people and even how to eat with a knife and fork. My real parents have been so kind and patient with me. Now, at the age of 19, I have some sort of normal life. I still find many things confusing, 
and I struggle being around large crowds. I had to get used to sleeping on a bed, and I find computers the most confusing thing ever. But I manage to function in the big, wide world. As for my fake mom and Toby, well, they were both sentenced for their involvement in my kidnap and are now in jail for a very long time. I have a chance at leading a normal life in the normal world, and even though what happened to me was horrible, I'm not going to let those cruel people ruin my life. I finally have a loving family, and I know that with their care and support, I can get through anything. Hi, it's me, Lou again. In episode one, I moved into Plutus Heights, and everything was going well until David showed up and rocked the boat. He told everyone I was his girlfriend, and at first, I was weirded out. But then I started to think maybe he was actually a pretty cool guy. Well, then he went and ruined that by asking me out on a date only to show me off, which resulted in him going to jail for drunk driving. As I bailed him out, he asked me if I wanted to be his girlfriend for real. To be honest, when he told me that he liked me, I was pretty moved. His deep voice and sincere look really touched my heart. But then reality hit me. David was still too young and ebullient. He probably just wanted me to be his girlfriend due to his contemporary feeling. So I held my breath for a second and replied to him, David, I'm sorry, but I don't think I could be your girlfriend now. I think we'd better have more time to get to know each other. He seemed disappointed, but managed to give me a hug and said, Yes, as long as you want. After that, we went home. And as we got home, no one even asked if we were fine and what just happened to us. Instead, Mark just blurted out, David, you loser. You need to rely on girls to help you? Come on, bro. Sort yourself out. Then he smirked at me. Ugh, what was wrong with Mark? David was his cousin. How could he be so heartless? This was too much. It made me so angry. I honestly couldn't hold back my feelings. So I said to Mark, Hey, if you don't have anything nice to say, then just keep your mouth shut, Mark. Seriously, I couldn't stand Mark one bit. Out of all the guys living in our home, Mark was the worst. He was just so rude. And from how he treated us at the investment club, it was clear he didn't respect anyone. One time, the club had a meeting to discuss an investment plan for a fancy restaurant for rich people in Las Vegas. And seeing as my family were in the restaurant industry, I plucked up the courage to share my ideas. But Mark shot down every single idea and even had the cheek to tell me that my ideas were stupid and too risky. It took all my strength not to storm out of there. He was horrible. Had it not been for my enthusiasm, I would have withdrawn from the club, since I couldn't stand Mark's unpleasant personality. Talk about the project. After two months of non-stop researching, it came to my most exciting part. We were about to fly to Vegas to check out the market. Our group had four members, and we gathered to board the plane. When we boarded the plane, Mark deliberately pushed past me so he could get to his seat first. Such a man! Was he still pissed off when I told him to shut up? The trip went quite successfully. We had gathered a lot of useful information for our investment plan. After working hard on our project, in our last night in Las Vegas before flying back to New York, we went to the casino to blow off some steam. I had never seen anything like it in my life. There were people everywhere betting thousands of dollars. It looked fun, but I had no idea how to play. So I just watched the gamblers and took it all in. As I was wandering around, I felt someone grab my hand. It was Mark. He was sitting playing a game of poker, and it looked intense. I tried to walk away from him, but he said, Come on, give it a try. And so I agreed and sat down next to him. He taught me the basic rules, and to my complete surprise, I was hooked. I got so into it, and by the third round, I was really playing well. Call it beginner's luck, but there was no denying that Mark and I made a good team. He actually called me his lucky goddess at one point. Every time we won, he gave me a high five, and at one point, he even gave me a massive hug. I guess he just got so caught up in the excitement of winning, but 
it felt good to be hugged by someone so handsome. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, it's just a cheering hug between friends, isn't it? We played for hours, and then eventually we got over it and went to the bar to get some drinks and celebrate how much money we'd won. By then, it was super late, and I was exhausted, so Mark walked me back to my room and said goodnight. As I flopped onto my bed, I thought to myself, maybe Mark isn't as bad as I thought he was. And then I drifted off into a drunken sleep where I thought about how fun we were that night and how handsome Mark was. The next morning, when I woke up, I had the worst headache. Clearly, I drank too much. I looked at the clock and freaked out. I'd definitely missed my flight. I grabbed my phone and was about to call Mark when I noticed I already had two missed calls from him. And then there was a text saying, You little sleepyhead, guess I'll see you back in New York then? I couldn't believe he'd left me here in Vegas all on my own. There was me thinking he was actually quite a nice guy, and now he'd gone and done this? Not cool at all. Well, I guess I'd spend another day or so in Vegas. Could be worse, right? I lay in bed for a while trying to get over my hangover, and then I went onto Facebook. I couldn't believe it. Jeremy had posted a status checking in to Las Vegas. I messaged him right away asking what he was doing here, and then he said he was putting on a show at a theater in the city. He invited me to join, and I agreed because it's not like I had other plans. That night, Jeremy sent someone to pick me up and take me to the theater. When I arrived, he was waiting outside to welcome me, and we chatted a bit. I told Jeremy that Mark had left me here all alone, and he just started laughing. He said, What a strange guy. How could he leave a girl as beautiful as you all alone in Vegas? Don't worry. I'll take good care of you, okay? Then he started stroking my hair, like I was his little sister or something. I was kind of surprised by how gentle and sweet he was being. I'd never really spent any time with Jeremy. I must have blushed, because the next moment, Jeremy was winking at me. And then he said he had to go backstage and get ready for the show. I'm not gonna lie, I assumed that Jeremy was only popular because he was good at promoting himself on social media. But when I watched him singing up there on stage like that, I was gobsmacked. He was incredible. Now I understood why all the girls swooned around him. Not only was he a babe, he was so flipping talented too. After the show, I waited outside for Jeremy. And then he said I could fly back to New York with him in his private jet and that his driver would take me to the hotel to get my bags. Wow, what a nice guy. We basically talked the whole flight. Chatting to Jeremy was so easy, and it was so comfortable. For someone so famous, he was pretty down to earth. I really enjoyed his company. Turns out, being left alone isn't too bad. I got to know Jeremy more and have an enjoyable experience. We arrived home early the next morning, and we were both so tired, I went straight to bed and slept until after lunch. When I woke up, I played on my phone for a bit scrolling through social media. That's when I saw it. An article had gone viral that Jeremy was having an affair with me. There were photos of us at the theater and even a photo of him stroking my hair. I started to panic. This was all just some crazy misunderstanding. How had I got caught up in the world of showbiz and gossip? I panicked and didn't know what to do next. While I was puzzled and worriedly scrolling down the pictures, suddenly my door burst open and Naomi barged into my room. Hi again, it's me, Lou. In season one, I told you guys about how I moved into a luxury mansion called Plutus Heights. I lived there with six other rich kids, Jeremy, Mark, Will, David, Aaliyah, Naomi, and got involved in all kinds of drama. First, there was David using me as his fake girlfriend. But later, he actually asked me to go out with him for real. Then there were rumors that Jeremy was having an affair with me, and so his girlfriend Naomi made my life hell. But luckily, a handsome mystery man came to the rescue, who turned out to be Mark. Now Mark and I are dating, and I've never been happier. Well, so are you ready for season two? Honestly, things between Mark and I have been great. 
and so have things at Plutus Heights. It's as if all the drama fizzled out, and the seven of us were getting along so well. We even decided to take a big group trip together to celebrate the end of the semester. And because we were all nearing the end of our time at college, which meant we wouldn't be living together much longer, we were having a Mediterranean cruise trip, traveling through Spain, Portugal, France. But when we were on the way to our next destination, Venice, Italy, the pandemic suddenly broke out of nowhere. So obviously, we had to change the itineraries and shorten our trip, which was a bummer, but luckily, we were solely traveling on our private cruise and staying in private resorts. So we weren't in danger. That's the most important thing. Though, along with the chaos going on out there with planet Earth, stuff on the cruise wasn't exactly peaceful either. A new chapter of drama has begun. One night, we were out drinking on the deck, enjoying some fancy French wine that we'd picked up along the way. It was the perfect night. The weather was warm and balmy, the stars were out, and there was this cool sea breeze all around us. I'd never experienced anything like it before. Even though my parents are rich, they didn't really flash their cash around, so I'd never really learned how to fully make the most of life like my friends had. And I thought, it's not too bad leading a modest life. Everyone even joked with me, saying that I was too uptight, and that my family was rich, but it was such a shame that I didn't know how to spend money. They were probably right. I really should let loose a bit and enjoy life a little more, as trips like this have been really fun. That night, we were drinking and chatting, when suddenly, Jeremy got up and said he had to have an emergency call with his tour manager after COVID had caused his tour to get canceled. That was so unfortunate. Everyone kind of quieted down after he left. Then Mark leaned over to me and said, Let's go back to our room too, babe. And that's when Aaliyah looked over at us and whined, Ew! Get a room! I can't stand watching you two lovebirds! Then she got up and left. It was kind of awkward, but David quickly interrupted and said, What is wrong with you guys? You're such party poopers. Stop killing my vibe. Listen up. No one is leaving until we finish this bottle. And at that, he popped open another bottle of champers, and we all cheered. We ended up staying up super late, reminiscing about the trip so far, and looking at all our photos. It was so much fun, and we all had a good laugh. At one point, Naomi popped up from her seat. Oh, Lou, remember that pic I took of you at Parkwell? That one was so funny. It's on Jeremy's camera, though. Let me go get it. Oh, and where's Aaliyah? Let me go get her, too. Then she ran off in excitement. We were all tipsy by this point, and in a good mood. We started talking about where we'd go next on our trip, and I suggested we should make this an annual thing because it had been so much fun. But just as I said that, I heard someone yelling. It was Naomi, and she didn't sound excited anymore. She was super angry. I can't believe it! In our bedroom? Jeremy, are you for real? You're cheating on me in our own room? What is wrong with you? Oh my god, Jeremy was a serial cheater! Poor Naomi! And then I started to panic. Who had he been cheating with? Please tell me it wasn't Aaliyah. We all ran to the room and I prayed so hard that it wouldn't be her, because then our friendships would all be over. The whole way to the room, we could hear Jeremy and Naomi shouting at each other. I am speechless, Jer! What do you have to say for yourself, hmm? Naomi screamed. Then Jeremy said, I, I thought it was you, babe. I'm a bit drunk. And she came into the room and it was dark and... Then Naomi interrupted, saying, What? You thought it was me? You're drunk, but you're not blind. Look, we look nothing alike. You've sunk too low this time, Jer. We caught up with them, and when we looked into their room, Jeremy was on the floor begging Naomi for forgiveness, and there was another girl on the bed. The maid! Oh my god, he cheated on Naomi with the maid! But at least, thank goodness, it wasn't Aaliyah. It could have been so much worse. Eventually, Aaliyah showed up to help me calm Naomi down, and that night, the three of us slept in Aaliyah's room. We couldn't leave Naomi alone because she was so upset. I couldn't believe how everything had just changed in the blink of an eye. One moment, we were having the best vacation of our lives, and the next, it was all a mess. Naomi only fell asleep around 3 a.m., 
and I only know that was the time because my dad suddenly called me. I would have thought it was strange, but it was still evening back in New York. Maybe he was missing me. I was actually relieved to speak to him, and I excitedly said, Hi, Dad. What's up? But as soon as I heard his voice, I knew something was wrong. He didn't sound happy at all. Pumpkin, um, there's this thing, you see. Our company? Well, it's having some trouble. This pandemic is so harsh. Could you come home soon? I really need your help. After that call, I couldn't sleep a wink. I was so worried about my family. The next morning, I told everyone what had happened, and they were so understanding. Will even offered to lend me his private jet so I could get home ASAP. Mark decided to come with me, so we packed up and got ready to leave. I felt so bad leaving Naomi after what had happened, but now I had my own heartbreaking news to deal with too. When we got home, my mom and dad sat us down, and it took a few minutes to tell me what was going on. The truth was, my dad had just filed for bankruptcy. It felt like my whole world had just come crumbling down around me as I heard my dad tell me. My whole body was shaking, and all I could say was, No! What? Then my dad explained, I'm afraid we just couldn't survive this pandemic. Our branches in Asia have been frozen for months, and now in Europe too. The domestic ones don't seem to be able to hold up for long either. It's been so hard, and there's nothing we can do now. But don't worry, Pumpkin. Just finish your studies. That's the important thing. We can still afford your last semester. Go get that degree, then come help me revive our company, okay? By the time he'd finished speaking, he was choked up, and we both started crying as he reached out to give me a big hug. I had to be strong and push through my last semester and graduate, no matter what. But it wasn't going to be easy. The news was already out. It was all over the internet, and even in the newspapers. Everyone knew my family had gone bankrupt, and I felt like all eyes were on me everywhere I went. It was so stressful, and I knew people were whispering about me. I was nervous to go back to the investment club, aka the rich kid club, because I knew they'd look down on me and my family now. And they did. Now, they made me do tasks that only newbies had to do, like collecting data and stuff. One time, we had a team meeting, and Mark needed someone to be team leader for the upcoming project. Who do you guys think will be suitable for this task? Mark said. To be honest, I didn't care. My head was elsewhere, worrying about my family's situation, but I quickly snapped back as I heard a girl mentioning my name. Anyone but Louise. Because obviously, her family's company is dead. We don't want her to push us into bankruptcy, too. Everyone laughed, and I was so humiliated. I almost burst into tears in front of them all and had to clench my fists and bite my cheek to stop myself from embarrassing myself even more. Suddenly, Mark slammed his fists down on the table and told them off. I was so grateful to him, but at the same time, embarrassed. I felt so vulnerable all of a sudden. But at least I had Mark. He was the only good thing in my life at that point. Even though he was my shoulder to lean on and we told each other most things, there was one thing I'd been hiding from him. Ever since we got back from the cruise, I'd been receiving hate mail. At first, I thought it was just some kind of prank, but now it felt serious. I was too scared to bring it up, as I didn't want to make the tension at Plutus Heights even worse. Things between Jeremy and Naomi were awful, and Naomi was moving out. So the last thing everyone needed was to hear about my hate mail. It started with a letter that said, What are you still doing here? You don't belong with the rich kids anymore. Who would say this to me? I didn't want to suspect any of my friends. I mean, why would they say that stuff to me? Plus, the message was made up from cut-off letters in magazines, so I couldn't even base on handwriting or anything to tell who it could be. That continued for two or three more times. Still, I tried to ignore it. But one night... After an exhausting day at school, I threw myself onto my bed and picked up my favorite book. But as I opened it, a letter fell onto me. More hate mail! This one said, So you're still here? Becoming a gold digger now, are you? We all know you can't afford to live here, and no one likes you anyway. So get your poor ass out of here. 
You're ruining our reputation. That was the cherry on top. I already felt stressed at college from all the gossip, and now I didn't even feel safe in my own home. This wasn't a home anymore. I immediately got up and packed my suitcase, crying as I did it. It was simple. I'd just leave. I hoped they'd all be happy now. It was already late, so everyone was in their rooms. I couldn't face seeing them, so I dragged my suitcase as quietly as possible downstairs to leave the house. I didn't even think about where I was going. I just figured I'd get out, find a cab, and go stay in some motel near the campus. As I was walking, I heard a car honking from across the road. Lou! Hey, Lou! Is that you? What are you doing outside this late? I turned around and saw it was David, and as soon as he saw me with tears streaming down my face, he leapt out of the car and came running over to me. Hey, hey, what happened? He asked me. I'm leaving, I told him through tears. That's what everyone wants, right? I'm sorry I bothered you all for so long. He looked confused and said, What? Who wants that? I don't. Come on, don't be ridiculous. Come back to the house. Let's sort this out. I refused and told him to leave me alone, but he'd already grabbed my suitcase and then he grabbed my hand and made me get in the car. I was really crying by this point as I told him about the hate mail, and he was so mad. As soon as we got home, he shouted at the top of his voice, Emergency meeting now! Everyone wake up! Then he ran around the house knocking on everyone's doors, even though I tried to stop him. Hi, it's me, Lou. I'm back again to tell you the final part of my story. But first of all, do you remember what happened in the previous part? Well, in the last episode, things between Mark and I were really awkward. He knew that my parents got a divorce, but hadn't even texted me once. In that very difficult time, the only person who was really there for me was Will. He comforted my dad and offered to help him start a new business. This made me look at Will in a whole new light. Then, our ceremony along with a big photo shoot arrived, and a terrible incident happened to me. Aaliyah mocked me and pushed me into the pool. Will saved me this time, and then I realized that maybe it was Will who had saved me the last time too. Will led me to the parking lot, and his hand felt so warm in mine, I started to feel butterflies in my stomach. He'd helped my dad, and now he'd helped me. He was really going above and beyond. He drove me home, and that's when I decided to ask him if he was the person who'd broken the lock that night and rescued me. He just shook his head, so I said, But the cufflink I found, it looks exactly like yours. Then he said, Oh. Probably just a coincidence. I decided to leave it after that. Even though he denied it, I still had a hunch it was him. Will dropped me off and came in to make sure I was okay. He offered to stay with me until Naomi got home, but I told him I'd be okay. After he left and I heard his car drive off, I suddenly felt so empty inside. Everything was silent, and I just lay there holding the cufflink that I kept under my pillow and fell asleep. A few days later, while I was sitting at home watching movies, I received a package. Inside was a wedding invitation from Jeremy, and it was for me and Naomi. I couldn't believe he'd moved on so quickly. I was even more surprised to learn that his bride was some model from Naomi's agency. I heard Naomi said that this girl was a real show-off. When Naomi got home, I showed her the invitation, and her face fell. She immediately ripped it up and said there was no way on earth she'd attend that traitor's wedding. I told her I wouldn't go either then, but she said I had to because I was Mark's girlfriend, and Mark was Jeremy's best friend. Was I, though? What was even going on with me and Mark? Anyway, I went to the wedding, and it was crazy. There were peacocks at the entrance, and everyone said they'd spent millions of dollars on flowers. They'd even had sculptures made of them both. It was insane, and the bride changed her dress five times. Obviously, I sat next to Mark, and Will was opposite me. Every time I looked up, Will would look away, but I could tell he'd been looking at me. I caught myself looking at him a lot, and I didn't really understand it, but it just made me feel warm and safe being near Will. 
I still felt sorry for Naomi, though. Watching Jeremy and his bride share their vows made me really touched. I held Mark's hand and said, Isn't it beautiful? And all he said was, Yeah. Mark's indifferent reply took the wind out of my sails, but when I looked over at Will, he was smiling sweetly at Jeremy and his bride. I suddenly felt a bit sad and couldn't take my eyes off of him, but then I realized Will could see me looking at him. Oops. Afterwards, Jeremy and his wife came to toast our table. They actually made quite a cute couple, but when the bride realized Naomi wasn't here, she got quite upset and started crying. She was obviously a bit of a drama queen, as she said, Everyone should be here to celebrate me! This is my day! I just laughed and couldn't say anything. After the wedding ended, I said goodbye to everyone and left. Suddenly, we were all grown up, and our carefree student days were over. Who knew what the future held for us? After graduation, I started working for Will's startup company. I thought it was the best way I could do to repay him for how he helped my dad. Pretty soon, we were hanging out a lot, and even though he'd always been caring, he'd never been so warm and friendly to me before. I felt so comfortable around him. One morning, I decided to take the day off work and go shopping with Naomi. We saw Patek Philippe's new watch collection, and it immediately made me think about Will. I decided to buy him one to thank him for everything. When I got home, I texted Will and asked if he wanted to come for dinner on the weekend so I could give the watch to him. I was so excited when he said yes. As for things with Mark, it was just getting worse and worse. He was busy all the time and often away on business trips, so I barely saw him, and it made me feel really sad. Not just once did I ask myself if our love story would have a future. Then one morning, I received a message from him saying, I have something to tell you. Let's have dinner tonight. I'll pick you up at 7.30. Apparently, he asked me out on a date, but somehow, I had a bad feeling. His tone was quite cold. Had something happened? That night, I put on my favorite dress and waited for him. He picked me up on time and took me to a very fancy restaurant. At first, we just caught up and spoke about normal things. Then, as we neared the end of the dinner, he said he needed to tell me something important. That feeling of anxiety washed over me again. I was shaking and sweating and just wanted him to spit it out. He took a deep breath. Then he said, Lou, this is really hard for me to say, but my parents have found me a fiancé. She's great and she will support my family business. I tried to tell them I'm with you, but they won't accept it. So I'll get married next month. I'm sorry. I was so shocked. I couldn't even say anything. I'd been the biggest idiot. This whole time, everything was laid out right in front of me. Ever since he'd agreed to the blind date, he'd been acting so weird towards me. Like the time at the pool where he just watched me struggle. How had I been so blind to this? Mark didn't care about me. He didn't love me. All he cared about was having a girl on his arm who would add to his image as a successful businessman and, of course, could support his family business. I thought I'd feel worse than I did, but I actually felt relieved. I said to him, You know what? You don't deserve me. We're over. Then I got up and left. I was disappointed, but I deserved so much better. Mark ran after me and offered to take me home, but I could get myself home. I didn't need him anymore. I didn't sleep a wink that night. I just lay there thinking about Mark and Will and all our friends. I still had dinner with Will at the weekend, and I didn't want to cancel it. Even though I didn't feel good, I knew Will would find a way to cheer me up like he always did. The weekend rolled around, and Will and I met at a restaurant near my house. He was carrying a bouquet of flowers, and I was surprised, but happy. You see, I knew he'd cheer me up. After we finished eating, I gave Will the watch. He wouldn't accept it, though, and even got a bit angry, saying, Why would you buy me such an expensive gift? You don't owe me anything, Lou. We're friends, and friends help each other out. I can't accept this. Then, before I could say anything, he said, And anyway, I wanted to help your dad because I'm looking to invest in the restaurant industry. So please, stop thanking me. 
then he pushed the gift box back towards me. Will, please, I bought this for you because you're my friend and I care about you, and it made me think of you. If you're my friend, you'll take it. He rolled his eyes and said, Fine, but you really didn't have to. After that, things were a little awkward, and Will asked me if I was okay. Yes, that moment, my heart was full of confidence. I decided it was better just to tell him. So I told him what had happened between me and Mark. He was surprised at first, but after a moment of silence, he suddenly looked at me, and he smiled, and it made me so confused. Then he said, Do you want to know a secret? Then he told me that he was the mysterious stranger that had broken the lock that day, and that the cufflink which I picked up was his. The M in this stood for his surname, Mitchell. Oh my god, I knew it! I mean, I hadn't even thought about his surname before, but it all made sense. Of course it was him. He said he'd kept it a secret because he'd learned that Naomi locked me in the room and he didn't want to cause any tension at Plutus Heights. Then he confessed that he'd had a secret crush on me ever since we watched the sunset together in a small corner in his mansion. But after that, he knew Mark liked me, so he'd kept his crush a secret and just protected me from afar. Until now, when he could finally tell me how he really felt. I can't say I was surprised. I mean, I always felt Will had feelings for me. And if I'm honest with myself, I had feelings for him too. But I hadn't even realized. After he confessed, he asked me if I wanted to date him. I didn't know what to say. I was so confused. We were in a romantic restaurant with a love song playing in the background. It all just felt too much. I sat there staring at him, and his eyes were so affectionate. Seeing my confusion, he just smiled and said, It's okay. Take your time. I'll wait for you. Then he took me home, and before I got out of the car, he grabbed my hand and kissed it. I quickly said goodbye to him and ran into the house. Then I lay down on my bed and thought about what Will had said, that he'd wait for me. I must have fallen asleep because the next moment I was dreaming of me and Will walking along the beach at sunset. The next morning, I woke up and I knew my answer. I texted Will and asked if he could meet me in the park near my house. As soon as I saw him, I looked in his eyes and said, Will, I've always been looking for my knight in shining armor. Now I know. It's you, and I will not miss this opportunity. He smiled brightly, hugged me tightly, and then kissed my forehead. Never had I felt so safe and warm with happiness overflowing in my heart. That's right, he was the one who saved me that day. The one who helped my family through difficult times, and also the one who has silently cared and protected me for so long. He was the guy who truly loved and cared about me. And ever since then, we've been an official couple, and I have never been happier than I am right now. I've finally found the love of my life, and life couldn't be sweeter. Thank you so much for listening to my story. Did you guess that I'd end up with Will? He was the one for me all along. It just took me some time to realize. But the best things are often the things worth waiting for. Hey, it's me, Kat. I'm back to fill you in on the next part of my drama-filled life. So, me and my mom have never got on that well. She hates my tomboy ways and wishes I was a girl. So when her new fiancé Max moved in with his Barbie doll daughter Taylor, well, my mom instantly loved her more than me. During an argument, she even told me that she couldn't love someone like me and that I should grow up. How could my mom say that to my face? and especially in front of that little brat, Taylor. I was so angry that I shut myself in my room that night and skipped dinner. But then, around 3 a.m., my stomach wouldn't quit growling, so I snuck down to the kitchen, and surprise, surprise, there was no leftover food for me at all. Great. Clearly, they didn't view me as a part of this family anymore and wanted me to starve to death. I couldn't fall back asleep after that. So as soon as the sun came up, I called my best friend Harry up early. He answered the phone half asleep. What? I told him to rise and shine, as I needed saving from my nightmare of a home life. Oh, and I also told him to bring food. He muttered out a, Yeah, fine. 
At least leaving early meant I wouldn't have to face Mom and Taylor. As soon as I got into Harry's car, he threw me a sandwich and asked what was wrong. And I told him how Taylor's basically nightmare Barbie. He grinned at me. Yeah? What did she do? Steal all your food? Trust him to make a joke out of my distress. Anyways, I told him everything that had happened while munching on the sandwich. He replied, Come on, cat. Like you're gonna let some 16-year-old get the better of you? How about I come over after school and suss out the situation? I'll fight off this kid for you. I jokingly replied, Okay. I guess that might help keep the peace, as for some reason, my mom seems to like you. So, Harry came around, and naturally, my mom was all over him, telling him how handsome he is and demanding he stay for dinner. Talk about cringe! Then I had to listen to mom telling him how she didn't understand me, and how he should talk some sense into me. Er, hello? I was still in the room. Then Taylor arrived home all shiny-haired and girly, I swear my mom's face lit up just by seeing her. And worse still, so did Harry's. Ugh! Oh, Harry, have you met Taylor? Cat's sister. She goes to the same school as you guys. Hi, Taylor. I've definitely seen you around, but I didn't know you were Cat's sister. She wouldn't tell me. He elbowed me while being all smiley to her. In that whiny voice of hers, Taylor replied, Nice to meet you, Harry. Are you Cat's boyfriend? We all burst out laughing. Then my mom chimed in. Honey, I wish, but no. Your sister seems to be allergic to love. But you two would make a lovely couple. What on earth? They both laughed and Harry replied. I'd love to, but such a pretty girl like Taylor wouldn't lay an eye on me. Great. Thanks, Harry. As if Taylor isn't big-headed enough. I slyly kicked Harry's leg and gave him a dirty look. After dinner, me and Harry went to play video games in my room. As soon as I closed the door, he told me that Taylor seemed all right. Was he blinded by her Barbie looks or something? I was so mad that I slammed down my game's controller and told him he sucked. Ugh! Why did everyone treat me like such a joke? So, what if I didn't dress up girly? I still had feelings. They knew nothing about me. I actually had a huge crush on this boy at school called Garrett. He was on the boys' soccer team, and he was so talented. I totally swooned out loud when he scored three goals in a row. I usually didn't like jocks. As a member of the girls' soccer team, our teams often trained together, and I had to put up with them showing off to impress girls, while in reality, they couldn't actually play, and they skipped practice all the time to go partying. Garrett was different. He totally shined amongst those useless guys. I took the initiative to talk to him. Turns out, Garrett and I had loads in common. We instantly clicked and talked non-stop about soccer, skateboarding, and other stuff. Okay, so there was one problem. He seemed to be interested in the cheerleader type of girl once he even admitted his celebrity crush was Selena Gomez. Yeah, I know. She's as girly as you can get. That got me thinking a lot. I definitely wouldn't change who I was, but maybe a little makeover wouldn't hurt, right? I told Harry about it, and he just told me it was stupid, and he wasn't really supportive, which was strange for him, but whatever. So Harry worked evenings and weekends at the burger joint in the mall. I knew it was just so he could check out the girls going into the clothes shop opposite. I knew if I was going to win Garrett's heart, then I'd need to change my style, so I started visiting Harry more often at work. I'd sit there munching on free fries while watching the girly girls shop so I could get the gist of the in trends and stuff. Then, I stole my mom's lip gloss and some glittery eyeshadow and put it on for school. I even started wearing this plaid purple skirt mom bought for me. I mean, at least it was sort of edgy, right? Though, I had nothing other than my collection of oversized tees to go with it, but whatever, it was girly enough. O-M-G. Wearing a skirt is hard work. I couldn't run as fast or jump up to grab something off the top shelf. I also kept on forgetting I was wearing a skirt and sitting with my legs apart. Oops! My plan was working, though, as Garrett started sitting with me and Harry at lunch. Oh, and one time when I was struggling to run in a skirt, he passed me his jacket to tie around my waist. It gets even better. He invited me to his soccer team party. OMG! Talk about hitting the jackpot! This meant he liked me, right? That was it. 
I decided that the party will be my grand finale. I'd get a total makeover and confess my feelings to him while there. Finally, the day of the party arrived, so I put my awesome plan into action. Okay, so mom's lousy makeup just wasn't cutting it, so I went into the drugstore and used up the testers. I even packed a pair of mom's high heels with me. Now all I needed was a dress. Obviously, I wasn't going to buy one for keeps. No, I'd wear them for the party and return it the next day. All of my spying taught me one thing. Floral print was the in thing right now. So I bought this flowy floral dress in my size and went to the mall restrooms to try it on, so I had more privacy. I put the high heels on and zipped up the dress, but it seemed a little tight. Jeez, talk about tiring. I could barely reach the zipper on my back. After, like, five minutes of struggling, I was impatient and used up all of my force to pull it up. Done. Finally. But, uh uh-oh, my hair was stuck in between the zipper. Ugh, stupid long hair. I began to panic. I was completely stuck. Harry was on shift in the burger joint, so I sent him an emergency message. He sent me five crying with laughter emojis back, but he also said he'd be straight over. I couldn't expect him to come into the girls' restrooms, so I had to try and walk out into the mall foyer. My hair was stuck, so I had my face up to the sky and every step was shaky due to the high heels. My two arms went straight out to navigate since I couldn't properly see the way. I must have looked like a zombie. People were whispering and laughing. It flustered me, and I tripped. The laughters were even louder now, and I couldn't even get up. I laid there in a weird position, feeling so helpless as anger and embarrassment filled me up. Thank God I heard a familiar voice. Cat? Are you okay? Harry to the rescue. Finally! He shooed everyone away, took the heels off my feet, and helped me get up. Then he said, Oh my God, Cat. What have you done? Seriously, why are you making a fool of yourself just because of some jock? You've lost yourself, Cat. He kept on grumbling as he tried to fix the zipper. Great, as if I wasn't already miserable enough. He was treating me just like my mom did. I was so angry, I pushed him out of my way as soon as he was done with the zipper, then stomped off. I was so mad. I washed all of the makeup off my face, changed back to my normal clothes, and went home. No more party or whatever. I was done. As soon as I reached home, I ran straight to my room, and saw a brand new dress on my bed. What? I never wanted to see one of those evil things again. I grabbed the dress and stormed downstairs and started screaming at mom. I won't wear this. I hate it. I will never be like Little Miss Perfect Taylor, so please stop. I expected mom to yell back, but to my surprise, she didn't. She told me that Harry had messaged her telling her what had happened. Oh my god, Harry, you snitch! I pulled out my phone and was about to dial the number to yell at him. Mom stopped me and continued. He's worried about you, honey, so he asked me to help you out. I saw this dress in a shop the other day and bought it for you to wear to my wedding, but I think today is a special occasion too. Put it on and go tell that boy you like him. Mom hugged me. Wow, talk about an emotional roller coaster. I was so touched and embarrassed about my thoughts and actions, so I agreed to let mom help me curl my hair and apply my makeup, and I wore the dress she bought. I actually looked pretty cute, not gonna lie. She looked so happy and wished me good luck as I walked out of the house in ballet pumps, not high heels. Those things are evil. The party was until later, so I texted Garrett and told him to meet me at the coffee shop around the corner. Everything was set. There's only one last step left. Hey, Kat here. I don't want to alarm you or anything, but this is the final part of my story. I hope you'll enjoy it. And here's a reminder of what's happened in the last part. You remember, my dad told me surprising news that he wanted to get back with mom, and he needed my help, don't you? Of course, I jumped at the chance and immediately put my healing family relationships plan into action. I knew I had to somehow delay mom's wedding to Max, so I pretended to break my leg. My plan was totally working, as not only did they postpone the wedding, but Max and Taylor moved out to give me time to heal. 
I was very satisfied because everything was going as I planned, when suddenly, right on the day I had the bandage removed, I arrived home to hear the awful truth that shocked me to my core. My dad didn't want me to exist in the world because I was a girl. As soul-destroying as it was, I continued to listen to mom and dad's conversation. I heard mom say, I will never forgive you and never forget the moment you wanted me to get an abortion. Never. So don't think I will ever let you come back to this family. Dad replied, Mary, please, I beg you. I'd heard enough, so I ran into my room. It all made sense now. No wonder Dad supported my tomboy style, because he desperately wanted a boy. As for my mom, she tried to make me dress up like a girl to get revenge on him. Feeling unwanted and unloved, I packed some clothes and quietly left the house. Normally, when I was upset, I would run to my dad's, but that option was out, obviously. So where could I go? Then I thought about Harry, so I called him to pick me up, and I just told him that I felt really bad right now and wanted to run away from home. Without knowing what the exact problem was, he showed up and drove us to the beach. He bought us loads of snacks, and we sat there in silence and watched the sun go down. Then Harry turned to me and said, Are you ready to talk about it now? I sighed, ate a handful of Cheetos, then told him everything. I still can't believe it. My dad, the person I love the most, didn't want me at all. Then my mom just used me to make him suffer. Talk about exhausting. It's best if I disappear from their lives. It's not like I'm wanted here anyway. Harry listened. He looked shocked, but he didn't interrupt me. Then he patted me on the back and pulled me in for a big hug. It was weird because we never usually showed each other that kind of affection, but it didn't feel strange at all. Instead, I felt safe next to him. At this vulnerable moment, he's the only person I still trusted. After a long silence, Harry turned to me and said, um, who said you aren't wanted? I'm happy that you were born. I mean, meeting you is the best thing that ever happened to me. I've never met someone like you before. Kat, you're a brave and an amazing girl. My heart skipped a beat, and I felt my face turn bright red. I never knew that Harry thought of me like that. Then he touched my hand and said, And there's something you should know. Um, I really... Oh my god, I didn't know why my heart was beating so fast. What's he gonna say? But then, his phone rang. It was my mom. She'd been looking for me for hours and was worried sick. When Harry told her I was with him and I was fine, she sounded so relieved. I'm not a blubber. I cried and couldn't stop. I let Harry tell her where we were. When mom arrived, she rushed over and hugged me. Why didn't you tell me you were at the beach? I was so worried. Honey, don't you ever do that to me again. I hugged her and cried so loud. I didn't really know why I cried. Maybe because it was the first time we've ever properly hugged and I could feel her love towards me. After we finally stopped crying, and trust me, it took a while, I told her that I knew the reason why she divorced dad. She wiped off tears on my face and said, Oh, sweetie. I kind of guessed you must have heard us fighting earlier. I'm so sorry about that. And now you know the reason why I was always so strict on you and wanted you to dress like a girl. To show your dad how amazing it is to have a daughter. But instead, you dress and behave like a boy. Just like your father wanted. But mom, you have to understand that I dress and behave like this because it's who I am. It's not because of dad. Not because of Harry. Not because of anyone. If I change, it would mean that I don't live as my true self anymore. So, can you please let me be me, Mom? My mom smiled at me and replied, Oh, of course, sweetie. I'm so sorry. I didn't know. It was so selfish of me. I was so focused on going against your father that I forgot about your feelings. Can you ever forgive me? Of course, mom. And then we cried again. Since then, things with my mom have improved a lot, but there was still some unfinished business I had to handle. Firstly, 
I had to swallow my pride and apologize to Max and Taylor. Harry came with me for moral support. We all sat down and I apologized for being a childish brat. You're a good man, Max, and my mom truly loves you. I would be grateful if you and Taylor would be a part of this family. Can you two please come back? I said. He looked shocked for a moment, but then he smiled at me and said, With pleasure. I miss your mom so much, it's driving me crazy. Yep, he's been so miserable without her, Taylor added. I'm sorry to you too, Taylor. Do you need some help with packing? I asked her. Taylor smiled at me and replied, Sure, that'd be great. So, Mum and Max had a small ceremony in the end, although I still ended up wearing a dress, but hey, it was an exception for Mum's special day. It was a beautiful ceremony, and Mum looked amazing. Next, I had to make Taylor and Garrett get back together. I went to see Garrett at school and told him that it was all my fault Taylor broke up with him. He looked quite shocked, but at the same time, he was also happy to hear me say that. Well, that was such a relief. I felt much better now, knowing that I cleared up all misunderstandings between them. Then, when I was having lunch with Taylor in the cafeteria, he walked over with this enormous bouquet of roses, passed them to her, and asked her to be his girlfriend again. Taylor looked so surprised, but then she gave me a worried look. I smiled and said, It's okay. You two are meant for each other. She was so happy she hugged me. I guess it was good to see her happy. And last but not least, I had to finish off the beach conversation with Harry. Obviously, I couldn't let that slide that easily. I've been thinking about it a lot, wondering what could it possibly be. Was it... Does he... Jeez, why does it feel like my whole body is heating up every time I think back to that moment? I asked him to come to the beach, where I prepared a blanket on the sand with two cans of Coke and a huge pizza. His face lit up when he saw the setup. We had an awesome time and didn't stop laughing, even when Harry teased me by reminding me how I'd worn a dress to impress Garrett. I looked Harry in the eyes and said, Thanks. Thanks for always having my back when I needed. And, um, meeting you is also the greatest thing that ever happened to me. You're the only one who accepts me for who I am. He touched my hand and said, Cat. Last time, I wanted to tell you something. I... I really like you, and I want us to be more than friends. Will you be my girlfriend? Oh my god, this was crazy! Suddenly, I felt so shy, so I gently punched his arm and turned away, looking elsewhere so he couldn't see I was blushing like a tomato. Then I said, Okay, fine, but it's just because I pity you. He laughed and hugged me. It felt so good being in his arms. Life was pretty great. Finally. But there was just one last issue to resolve. My dad. I went round to his place and we had a super long talk. He admitted he messed up and apologized for what he'd done in the past and for trying to get me to split mom and Max up. He told me that it didn't matter if I was a boy or not. He will always love me and is very proud of me. So, as you can see, it's been a whirlwind, but it all worked out in the end. I have the best boyfriend ever, and an amazing family. I've been through a lot, but all I'm gonna say is, never change who you are just to fit into the norm or to please anyone. Be yourself, and the right people will love the real you. If they can't accept you for who you are, then they're just not worth it. Hey. Bella here. I'm 23 years old, and I have big dreams of becoming a talent architect. I was born in a pretty normal family. Don't get me wrong, I adore my family a lot, but they don't understand my deep passion. I didn't want to stay in my dreamy childhood town and have some ordinary job. I wanted to design amazing houses and eco-friendly hotels. I studied super hard on my degree, and it all worked out as this major architect company called the Starcross Estate Company offered me a job. And better still, it meant I got to continue staying in sunny California. OMG, talk about amazing. Well, at least I thought it was down to my hard work and talents. You see, my boyfriend Ed also works for the Starcross Estate. 
I met Ed at a college party a few years ago. At that time, I was still a student and he was an alumnus. We bonded over our love of modern architecture and ecological buildings. It took over a year for me to build up the courage to confess my feelings to him. We were at this cafe near college, and I was so nervous when I mumbled it out. Luckily, he figured out what I was trying to say, so he held my hand, then said, Yes, Bella, I'm such an amateur when it comes to matters of the heart, but I feel the same about you. I fell madly in love with him, and being around Ed, well, it was when I was at my happiest. Then, after my graduation ceremony, I mentioned how I wanted to find a job nearby so I could stay in Cali and be close to him. He said there was a position going at his workplace, and if I gave him a copy of my CV, he'd pass it on. He often told me that he could hook me up with a job there when I graduated, but I just thought he was joking. I mean, he was just some intern, right? It was not like he could help me to get a job at a large company like the Starcross Estate. Anyway, I still gave it to him to find a chance. Then a week later, I got called in for an interview. Then later that day, they called me back saying I'd got the job. I almost screamed when I was running to tell him in excitement, but he just smiled and said, You didn't trust me back then, did you? Congrats, my new colleague. I was over the moon and couldn't wait to start my next chapter. On my first day, I was super nervous, but Ed said I could go in with him. As we walked in, the receptionist looked at Ed and said, Morning, Mr. Stratford. Your father would like to talk to you in his office. What? I stared at him open-mouthed. He quickly explained to me how he was not only the head of the project management department, but his father owned the company. I'd been dating him for over a year, and he'd never thought fit to tell me this. It was true that he didn't need to tell me about his family, but this fact was too overwhelming. I had a job in the design department of a prestigious architecture company. And yes, I was the boss's son's girlfriend. This made me kind of awkward. I'd always believed that I could get this job because the company saw my ability, not because the one who introduced me was the heir. But soon, I surely would show that I deserved to be there, regardless of who I was dating. But everything was not that easy. Word soon got around the office that I was Ed's girlfriend, and I was constantly getting dirty looks from other people. Once, I was in the toilet cubicle and overheard some girls talking about me. One girl said, Talk about favoritism. The new girl in the design department didn't even experience one day as a trainee. Then another girl said, That bumpkin wouldn't survive for long. Maybe she only lasts a week. Wanna bet? Of course no. Who will we bet with when we're on the same side? <laughs> so, hello from the other side. I just couldn't hold it and walked out to see who was badmouthing me. And I saw that one of the girls was Diane, who worked in the sales department. What made it worse was she'd always been super nice to me up until this point. I could see their funny faces when they saw me there. Don't act like that. You are still good girls, not talking behind my back, but my front, I said, then left them frozen inside. I thought that would be the end of it, but it turns out it was just the beginning. Since that day, Diane sneered and made nasty comments whenever I passed her, such as, Yuck, have you seen the state of her shoes? And, Someone should tell her frizzy hair is not a trend. I tried my best to ignore her, but then one time, I got a really strange email from a customer telling me how she was conflicted if she should go with my design or not, after what my colleague told her about me. It turns out, Diane had told this customer that I was an immoral person who stole other people's designs and tried passing them off as my own. Saying snide comments about me was one thing, but badmouthing my work? Now. That was a step too far. I waited until Diane came out of her meeting, then I pulled her aside and said, Look, you can't go around saying I steal other designers' work and use them as my own. I've worked hard to get here, and saying stuff like that is not fair. She snorted. Yeah, right. You're only here because you went crying to your boyfriend for a job. I'm here because I'm good at what I do. <laughs> Whatever. You're not good enough, and he'll see that eventually and choose me instead. What? Suddenly, this all made sense. She was being a mean girl because she had a crush on my boyfriend, and she was jealous he was with me, not her. So I kept my cool when I said to her, If your problem is Ed, 
and you think you're good enough to deserve him instead of me, you should focus on him only. Don't change your arrow direction to me and my work. You'll get nothing. Diane seemed really mad. So, okay, the one who should get mad was me, not her. Luckily for me, my boss Jim wasn't like Diane. Instead, he was a really nice guy who didn't treat me differently just because of who my boyfriend was. One time, I was snooping through his profile, purely for project purposes, and I discovered he went to the same college as me, just at different times. I mentioned this to him, and he smiled and said, Yeah, that's where I met your boyfriend. He's a good friend of mine. Oh, I hated the word boyfriend at work, so I just ignored it and changed the subject. But anyway, it was good news, right? Jim was Ed's best friend, so at least I could trust him and learn from his work experience. Since I'd worked at Starcross Estate, I often had lunch with Ed, Jim, and Ellie. Ellie was Ed's half-sister, and also his assistant. She was really sweet and ridiculously beautiful. The way she talked and acted made me overwhelmed. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that she was such the cleverest and gentlest girl I'd ever met. Gradually, I spent more time after work with Ed, Jim, and Ellie. We usually spent all dinner time discussing work. To me, three of them were the colleagues that I always wanted to work with. But, except business things, I didn't know a lot about Jim and Ellie's personal life. Ellie was sweet and all, but she was also a kind of private person and somehow distant from others. Except for Ed, of course. And about Jim, he even had never been close to me and only seemed to talk about work stuff. They were both close to Ed, so I wanted to make friends. But, well, maybe they just saw me as their colleague. As for work, yeah. That was going pretty great. But then in true mean girl fashion, Diane struck again. One day, she stormed over to my desk, slammed a folder full of my designs down onto it, and started yelling at me, You've not followed the customer's requirements, and they're not happy. I replied, Oh, I'm sorry. I'll fix it right away. It's not good enough? You're clearly not good enough to be here. Your work's sloppy, and you don't listen. I forced a smile back and said, Okay, I'll fix it. She didn't let me finish my words, but just rudely walked away while all of my colleagues were looking at me suspiciously. This whole incident made me feel super deflated. I didn't understand it. I reread the design requirements through and had never seen those orders. Hadn't I? I tried to forget about it all and enjoy my evening as I was out for dinner with Ed, Jim, and Ellie. We were just quietly enjoying the meal as usual when Ed and Ellie had unexpected work pop up and had to leave. Jim gave me a lift home, and I thought it would be a super awkward and silent journey. But then he asked me if I was okay about what Diane had done to me. I didn't expect him to care about my problem. I always thought that Jim was a stone cold who cared about nothing but work. But turned out, he was so delicate and caring. Then he continued, as a head of my department, I'm sorry that I can't step in to defend you if the problem isn't big enough. Because, you know, it could make the situation worse, and you might suffer more from everyone's gossip. I understand, I honestly said. I think you're a very talented designer, and Ed's girlfriend or not, there's no doubt that you're the best person for the job. If I was you, I'd carry on doing what you're doing and show them all how deserving you are to be there. Jim smiled and patted my shoulder when he said that. I really appreciated Jim's words. I knew he was a nice guy, but he seemed so work-focused and could come off kinda cold, so it was good to see another side to him. I took his advice, and I put all my motivation into creating the best work possible. I read through all the job requirements I was sent at least three times and jotted down notes so no one could catch me out again, and I often spent my breaks in the office learning more about the company or discussing architecture with Jim. I was finally beginning to feel like I belonged there, and that my colleagues were beginning to believe this too. Little did I know, another storm was waiting for me. That day, when I was about to leave work, an email from Diane popped up. I opened it, thinking it was work-related. But no. It said, Break up with Ed right now, before everyone knows what a loser you are. He loves me, not you, and I have proof. Attached to the email were a bunch of pictures. Seriously? Could this actually be happening? My heart was pounding like crazy, and my hand was shaking as I clicked on the first image. Hey, it's me, Bella again. Are you curious about the next part of my story? So, before I tell you what happened next to me, just have a quick refresher. In the last episode, 
I got to work in Starcross Estate Company, and there's this girl called Diana who constantly bothers me. She even said that my boyfriend Ed loved her and told me to break up with him. Of course, I'd not be fooled by her, but the fact that Ed's behavior became more and more cold to me made me feel anxious. Later on, Ed had a long business trip with Diane. Whilst I was in need of his reassurance, he still kept his coldness towards me. That's why we ended up having a big fight. Then he sent his friend Jim to take me out for the day, instead of coming round himself. I had a wonderful day with Jim, but later that night, I may have ended up drinking one too many cocktails and shots and telling Jim how upset I felt. Then I asked him whose side he'd be on if Ed ever betrayed me. Jim looked a bit awkward, but then he said, Ed's a good guy with morals, and he's mad about you. I couldn't imagine him ever looking at another girl. I drained my drink. Yeah, I know, bad idea. Then I slurred out, You have to say that. You're his best friend. You might just think I'm overthinking stuff, but you're not a girl. You don't understand how much it hurts. Jim looked at me with a firm voice. He said, I truly believe him. So I'm going to make a deal with you that if Ed ever did cheat on you, then I'd help you get your own back. At this point, I was really surprised. But then I knew that even though Jim was so certain as much, it was only due to his complete trust in Ed. So I just shrugged it off and gave him a smile. After that, Jim took me home. He helped me to open the car door, and before I entered my house, he said, Bella, don't think too much about it at all. That night, I lay there thinking about what Jim had said to me at the bar. Maybe he was right. Maybe it was true that I was overthinking things. And also, if I kept being like this, wasn't this exactly what Diane wanted me to act like? Jeez, it seemed she was way smarter than she looked, as she got into my head. I couldn't let her win. I needed to trust in Ed. So I texted Ed. I'm sorry. I was so stressed that I blamed you, but I was wrong to do this. I miss you so much. Although it's midnight, he replied immediately saying, It's okay. I'm sorry too. I promise I'll spend more time with you. I'll be around more in two weeks. His words made me feel a lot better. Finally, I could rest my mind and fall asleep. The next two weeks seemed to drag on forever. I missed him so much. Okay, so he didn't call me all that much, but it was okay. He promised he'd spend more time with me soon. So I decided to trust him. Two weeks passed by. He'd fly back home on this Sunday, and I arrived at the airport to pick him up. I dressed up in a pretty dress, held a bouquet of flowers, and waited for him at the boarding gate. Normally, I hesitated to do stuff like this because I knew there'd be a company shuttle coming to pick him and his colleagues up, but I'd waited for this moment long enough. Besides, I honestly thought he'd be super excited to see me. I waited for him there for about 30 minutes, and the moment I saw him, I waved and ran over to him. But all of my excitement vanished when he just gave me a cold look. He told me there was no need to do this and that he had to go back to the company to report the work immediately so he couldn't go out with me. This made me feel so down. I almost burst into tears, but I tried to hold it back as I said I understood. As he walked off, I stood there still clutching the flowers and feeling embarrassed. Even worse, I met Diane walking behind Ed. She laughed sarcastically and said, See, I told you he doesn't love you. He loves me. He's just busy, I croaked back. There was no way I was giving her the satisfaction of thinking she had one up on me. Yeah, whatever, she rolled her eyes. You realize we have today off as the report's not due until tomorrow? So... It seems to me like your boyfriend's just not into you. Diane grinned at me and walked off. At that point, I was so hurt and bewildered. I tried not to believe her, but there was no denying that Ed's reaction had been unexpected. I drove home feeling like a deflated balloon. Then I received a message from Ed. Sorry, I'm just so busy. Next Saturday is better. I'll come over to yours and we can watch a movie together. I felt excited at first, but thinking about his coldness at the airport, I felt a bit confused. Talk about hot and cold. I just didn't know where I stood with him anymore. Finally, I just texted him back. Yeah, sure. The next morning, I showed up at work, but I couldn't stop myself from trying to catch a glimpse of Ed. For the rest of the week, I kept an eye on him to see where he went, what he did, and if he met anyone strange. When he said he had to work overtime, I even called Ellie to check if he was being honest, but she confirmed this. Maybe I was being paranoid. 
One day, after a long working day, I felt a bit stressed, so I called Ed and said I wanted to go out with him to let off some steam. He messaged back saying that he had some family thing he couldn't get out of. I was disappointed, but I ended up going to the mall with my friend instead. We were sitting in the foyer eating donuts when I saw Ed walking into a jewelry store. This was so strange. What was he doing here? And why had he lied to me? I followed him to the front of the store and overheard him saying he needed to get a present for Ellie Stafford. Okay, so talk about a relief. So this was his family thing. Maybe today was his sister's birthday or something. But he still could have brought me along with him. Oh well, men just didn't think sometimes. Finally, Saturday arrived. Ed told me to prepare some snacks for the movie while he grabbed a quick shower. As he closed the bathroom door, I saw him leave his phone on my bed. I know it's a bad thing to do, but I couldn't stop myself from checking his private world. Maybe it's due to my worries and insecure feelings lately. I scrolled through all his old messages, but there was just a bunch of boring messages from his work colleagues. Suddenly, he opened the door and saw me using his phone. Startled, I immediately threw his phone onto the bed and jumped back. Ed looked annoyed and said, Are you checking my phone? I replied, Sorry, Ed, I just... He didn't let me finish the sentence. He angrily told me not to do it again because he didn't like to have a possessive girlfriend who wants to control his life. At this point, I was super embarrassed. Therefore, I timidly said, I just want to see pictures from your latest business trip. Oh, I prepared your favorite snacks here. Come, come here. I ran to him and pulled him over to my bed. My distraction plan seemed to work, and we had a really nice night together. As good as it was, doubts still lingered in my mind. He'd just been acting so oddly recently. To be honest, the feeling of doubting the person you love is not pleasant at all. So I decided to have a clear talk with him on our upcoming two-year anniversary. We really needed to have a frank talk. This was on Saturday night. He took me to this amazing restaurant, and the food was delicious. As great as it was, I knew I still needed to talk to him. And it was now or never. I opened my mouth to tell him how I felt when he said, It's my mom's birthday next week, and I'd love you to come over to my house and celebrate with my family. Oh my god, this was such a surprise! Finally, after two years, I'd get to meet the rest of his family! This proved that he really loved me and was serious about our relationship. Right? I was so happy that I said yes and gave up on talking about my worries. Then we talked a bit about what gift we should buy for his mom. Then suddenly, Ed received a phone call. He went out to answer it, and when he came back, he said an urgent job had come up and he had to leave. As much as this sucked, I forced out a smile and told him it was fine, and I could make my own way home. He said sorry, hugged me, and left in a hurry. But just a few minutes later, my phone beeped. It was a message from Diane saying, The Redmore Hotel, room 155. Come and see us for yourself, smirk face icon. This had to be just one of Diane's games, right? But it seemed so strange how she'd messaged me just after Ed had left. I peered around me. Was she here spying on me? But I couldn't see her anywhere. I needed to know the truth, so I hopped in a taxi and went to the Redmore Hotel. When I got there... I was so anxious. I stood outside of room 155 and pulled out my phone to call Ed. He didn't answer, but I heard Ed's familiar ringing sound from inside of the room. At this point, I really froze and tried one more call and still heard the ringing of the phone. Unconsciously, I banged on the door and screamed out for them to let me in. I pounded the door so hard that my hands turned red. I shouted, Open the door, you cheaters! Till my throat was sore. That moment, I didn't even know what was occupying my mind. I just knew that my heart was crushed, that I could hardly breathe, and my tears kept shedding. Moments later, the door opened, and Ed stared back at me. Hi everyone, I'm Amanda, and I'm 17 years old. This is a story about how I fell in love with my adoptive dad and the crazy things I discovered because of it. I need to be honest, as I've not had the easiest life, so when I fell in love with him, I probably wasn't thinking straight. My childhood was tough, as it was just me and my mom, and we lived in a slum in the city. 
My mom was pretty irritable, and she always took it out on me when she'd had too much to drink. I got used to it quickly, and hardly even cried when she did this. I just thought it was normal to be treated like this. But when I was seven, my mom got arrested for fraud and drug use, and she got sentenced to 10 years in prison. I'll never forget the moment the police broke our door down and took my mom away. It was late at night, and I just screamed and cried. All I had was my mom. Without her, I was nobody. Even though she hurt me when she was drunk, she was still my mom, and I loved her so much, and she loved me too. After she was taken away, and the police said I wouldn't see her for a while, social services placed me in an orphanage. Life there was even worse than in the slum with my mom, but I told myself it was only 10 years, and that as soon as my mom was released from prison, she'd come get me, and that by then, she'd have changed and wouldn't hit me anymore. But that's not what happened. After one year, an old couple came to adopt me. They'd been trying to have a baby for years with no luck. I thought maybe this was my chance to finally have a loving home. They cried with happiness when they saw me, but the minute we got back to their house, everything went downhill. They were both quite old and strict, and immediately sat me down and went over their set of rules. It was torture. Anytime I did one thing wrong, like accidentally breaking a glass or spilling some soy sauce on the table, they'd punish me by starving me for the whole day, until I almost fainted. After three months of this, they took me back to the orphanage and complained that I was a spoiled little brat with no manners. To be honest though, I was relieved. They were old and grumpy, and we clearly weren't well suited. Years passed by, and when I was 12, I was adopted by another family who ran a small restaurant. I stupidly thought it would be better this time, and at first it was, but pretty soon they started making me help out in the restaurant, doing all their chores and even the housework at home. I very quickly realized they'd basically just adopted me so I could be their maid. But there was one nice thing about this family, their son. His name was Jose and he was two years older than me. Unlike his parents, he was actually super kind. He would often steal food from me from the kitchen and even helped me finish the chores. But one time, his mom saw Jose helping me and thought I'd forced him into it. She was so angry at me, she took me straight back to the orphanage. I couldn't believe it. After four years, they just sent me back. After those two disastrous attempts at being adopted, I thought I'd never find a family who actually wanted me. I pretty much gave up all hope and resigned myself to the fact that I just have to endure the orphanage life until my mom got let out of prison. But then, one day, a man named James came to the orphanage to volunteer, and that's when my life changed. He looked quite young, around 40 or so, and he had a kind smile. Often, I'd catch him looking at me, and it made me feel quite shy. No one had ever paid me attention like this before, not even my mom. Then one day, the woman who worked at the orphanage took me aside and told me that James wanted to adopt me. I told them I wasn't interested, and then I went to my room. Honestly, I was sick and tired of these foster families who just used me. I didn't want to go through that again. The next day, I was sitting on the swing in the garden of the orphanage when James came over. I got up off the swing and was about to leave when he asked if we could sit and talk a little bit. I was really hesitant but he had such a kind face, and I felt bad being rude. He then showed me a photo of a woman and a child, and I couldn't believe how much the child looked like me when I was younger. He told me that they were his wife and his daughter, but that they had died in a car accident eight months ago, and that he still couldn't get over the loss. So he'd been coming to the orphanage to volunteer, and now he felt ready to adopt someone. Then he looked at me and said, As soon as I saw you, Amanda, I knew you were the one I wanted to adopt. I didn't know what to say. I felt so sorry for him, and I knew what it felt like to experience loss. So I told him I'd be happy if he wanted to adopt me. He was so excited, and the very next day, he came to pick me up and take me to my new home. I was quite nervous, but as soon as I saw how cozy the house was, covered in family photos, and with a nice bedroom for me, I knew I'd made the right decision. James was the perfect adoptive dad. He was polite and kind and always listened to me. He didn't make me do chores, and he didn't create a strict set of rules for me to follow. 
With him, I could just be myself. And for the first time in years, I was happy. He made me laugh so much. Finally, life was good. But there was just one little problem. You see, I was a teenage girl. And the more time I spent with James, the more I started to think I liked him in a way that wasn't appropriate for a relationship between an adoptive dad and his daughter. One night, he was getting out of the shower, and he'd left the door open. I saw him standing there, wearing a towel around his waist, and I couldn't take my eyes off him. I knew it was wrong to be looking, but I just couldn't stop. Then one day, he was doing some gardening, and he hurt his back. I offered to give him a massage, and he was so grateful. As I rubbed his back with oil, he said to me, Oh, Amanda, your hands are so soft. I haven't felt so comfortable in a long time. I was glad he couldn't see my face because I was blushing like crazy. Afterwards, he offered to give me a foot massage, but I said no because I didn't think I'd be able to handle it. I liked him so much, and that night, I went to bed wondering if he liked me too. And then one night, he asked if he could read me a bedtime story. Even though I was 16, he said he'd always read to his daughter and he missed it. So I said sure he could. And then, you won't believe it, he fell asleep next to me. In my bed! I barely slept a wink that night. I just watched him as he slept and had to stop myself from reaching out to stroke his hair. I so badly wanted to tell him how I felt. But for now, this was enough. Just being close to him and getting to have a peaceful life together. Little did I know that our peace was about to be disrupted. A woman moved in next door to us. Her name was Rosa, and she was seriously gorgeous. After she'd unpacked, we went over to say hi, and straight away, I regretted it. She immediately started flirting with James, even reaching out and stroking his arm as she said, Oh my, look at those muscles. I'll need your help setting up my kitchen, if you don't mind. James just laughed and said he'd be happy to help. As we walked away, I looked back and saw Rosa checking out James, and I knew she was going to be trouble. And sure enough, after that first meeting, she kept popping up. The next day, she asked James to help her fix a light bulb, and then a few days later, she came over with a plate of muffins to thank him. She never really spoke to me. She only had eyes for James, and I didn't like it one bit. Was she trying to steal him from me? The more she hung around, the more jealous I became. Everything had been perfect until she turned up, and now I was so scared James would fall for her and I'd be all alone again. My feelings were becoming so intense, so I decided there was only one thing for it. I had to tell him how I felt. I was pretty sure he had feelings for me too. I had to act quick before Rosa made a move. 